and gentlemen, welcome to Marketing Monday on August 7th, 2023. This is the show called Wins and Fails, where we go over all the wins and fails in the last week of marketing and business. And this week, we deep dived on a few interesting ones. Now, there's been a lot of main characters in Marketing Monday history. We've talked about Elon a ton, Zuckerberg a ton, oh, Jeff Bezos. But I want to introduce a new character to the billionaire crew that we like to cover here on this show. And that is a man from Japan by the name of Masayoshi San. And in case you're worried, he is a billionaire. 26.4 billion USD. This this guy is very funny and very interesting. I feel like it'd be good if you guys knew more about him because I have a very interesting story related to him today. So Masayoshi San is the head of SoftBank Group, one of the largest multinational corporations in Japan, basically a massive bank. They also do like cell phones and everything else, <laughs> but it's basically a bank, okay? And in 2017, he said he was gonna bet big on the future and raise the largest investment fund the world has ever seen, 100 billion dollars. <laughs> he wanted to raise a hundred billion dollars and invest in new stuff for the future. And he did do that <laughs> with an incredible amount of due diligence. Let's watch this clip right now. To, oh. Start by asking you about a fund that you are now raising, the Vision Fund. It's the Vision Fund. A fund of a hundred billion dollars. Yes. Now that would be the biggest fund ever raised. So when you told people you were going to raise a hundred billion dollar fund, did they tell you you were a little crazy? Oh, well, some people said. <laughs> you had a meeting with a man who was the He's a charmer. crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who's now the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. In one hour, you convinced him to invest $45 billion. No, no, it's not true. Okay. 45 minutes, $45 billion. Okay, sorry. Okay, I apologize. Sorry, it wasn't an hour. It was 45 minutes. Basically convinced the crown prince of Saudi Arabia to give him $45 billion, half of his fund, in 45 minutes. How did he do that? In other words, so, if you had had- one, 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 one billion dollars per minute. What could you have said <laughs> that was that persuasive to get 45 billion in one meeting? Well, actually, uh, I said, you came to Tokyo as the first time. I want to give you a gift, a trillion dollar gift. <laughs> and he opened up his eyes and said, okay, now it's interesting. Here is how I can give you a trillion dollar gift. You invest hundred billion dollars to my fund and give you a trillion dollars. So basically he just promised him guaranteed 10X returns. No thought on how he's gonna do it, what he's gonna invest in, what the plan is, specifics. It was more like, I'm a genius, I'll, I'll 10X your money. Well, he got the money from Saudi Arabia and other places. He got the 100 billion and he invested it in all sorts of companies that he called the vision fund, in companies that were gonna change the future. Only it turned out that the amount of diligence his investment partners did is the same amount of diligence he did in picking investments, which is basically none. <laughs> he spent almost no time checking if they were good investments and basically just asked, is it growing? And so they created a weird set of incentives and humans are very incentive driven. <laughs> so if they find out that there's a rich Japanese man throwing away a hundred billion dollars to any company that says it's growing, you're going to get a lot of weird situations. Like, for example, WeWork by this guy. This is the biggest and largest fraud of them. I'm not going to say about it very much, but Adam Newman of WeWork basically promised the world. He said WeWork wasn't just renting out office space. It was a physical social network that was going to change everything about work together. It was going to bring humans together, forged by human connection. He said a bunch of kooky shit. He promised massive growth. Then he basically siphoned all the money out of the company. For example, he had the company pay himself for the trademark we. <laughs> He bought a giant guitar-shaped house with company money. He bought a private jet with company money. He ran the company basically into the ground. And then when SoftBank realized they were being bamboozled and stepped in to rescue it, he walked away with a $1.7 billion exit to be fired. <laughs> An ultimate con artist. But that's the type of stuff that Masayoshi San and his $100 billion fund was attracting. On a smaller scale, you may have heard of this guy, Alex Garden. <laughs> Alex Garden founded Zoom Pizza, which again, wasn't just a food truck that served pizza. It was a revolution of the mobile food industry. <laughs> It was going to use robots in moving trucks to make pizza faster and fresher than ever before. It was going to dominate the entire pizza market. Well, it turns out it didn't work. The cheese kept sliding off as the robots tried to make it. The pizza wasn't even that good and it cost more. <laughs> 
so I did terribly. And of course, Zoom shut down after raising $450 million from SoftBank. Another terrible investment, Masayoshi san. I'm shutting the stage here because at the end of the day, after putting in $100 billion and promising a trillion, basically all of them lost money. <laughs> And at the end of the day, right now, they're down about $34 billion in just a few years. People aren't super happy with their investments in the Vision Fund, including the reason that I don't really care. I'm not pressed about it. It's because the biggest loser was the Saudi Wealth Fund. <laughs> The Saudi Wealth Fund, who we promised the 10x return to, have basically lost $16 billion. So I'm not too impressed. I mean, whatever. You want to lose it, you want to lose it. But a new story came out just this week about one of the people he invested in for the Vision Fund that I think is particularly hilarious. And it's the story of this guy, Abraham Shafi, the millennial founder. I think this is the only millennial founder he invested in. And this guy really did millennials proud because he was the creator of an app called IRL that wants to get people together offline. It basically, the, the thesis was teens spend too much time on their phones, too much time indoors. We're going to build an app that has them connect, meet up, hang out, and take over. And so in 2018, he started this app and started raising a ton of money from Masayoshi-san. The early numbers looked great. It had a good story and a good hook. People were scared about phones and it started to get downloaded. One fourth of all US teens downloaded this app. 30% were using it on a daily basis. It had 12 million monthly active users. It was blowing up. And they had to spend almost no money on acquisition costs. They only spent 50 grand a month, less than 50 grand a month. They were spending nothing to acquire users. It was going viral. This app was doing amazing. So SoftBank stepped in and said, I have to get a part of this. This is the future. This is the vision fund. And he spent $150 million to buy shares. Now, unfortunately, a few people around the company, vendors, etc., started to notice that there was a lot of bots <laughs> on the platform. They warned the CEO. They said, hey, there's a, there's some kind of bot attack going on, I think, because there's, there's so many fake groups I'm seeing and, and there's not a lot of activity in certain areas. But he, the CEO, kept saying we were having an amazing user increase. <laughs> when they asked how daily active users were spiking up, he said nothing specific happened. Engagement's increasing. Users just spiking. Our servers are on fire. <laughs> we are just beginning our journey of massive growth and engagement. <laughs> it turns out they were actually spending $50,000 a month for making an army of bots and that the entire platform's users were basically fake from the beginning. They were also spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to a firm ran by IRL's own head of growth to hide on the books what they were spending on acquisition costs. The whole thing was employed, by the way, by like eight of his cousins. It was like him, five siblings, and eight cousins. <laughs> in an elaborate scheme to just make a fake company with fake users. The estimate said that 95% of all users that ever used the site were fraud. <laughs> and whenever people checked in the app, they noticed that it had millions of private groups. If you think of like Facebook events or something like that, it's kind of like that for Zoomers in an app. And it turns out that all of the groups had identical names, like the play video games groups. There was 4.7 million of them. The book club group. Who the fuck didn't realize it was fake when it said there was 4.3 million US teens in book club groups? <laughs> How the fuck do you not have that red flag? And then 2.1 million in a Call of Duty squad. SoftBank supposedly had a robust due diligence process. But from everything I can see, it feels like Masayoshi-san and SoftBank never even opened the app. <laughs> they just threw money at it, assuming the numbers were true. Because when you look at these statements and also what you can see, it was very obviously full of bots. The real red flag of this lawsuit, which is what SoftBank is doing to uh, the CEO right now, was that there was a JIRA ticket from one of the employees basically asking openly for more fake users. <laughs> Uh, Jira Dick is like an internal tool you can use to ask for things from engineers. And they basically said it was a plan to, quote, add fake users and fake chats to all public groups with less than 10 people. It even described exactly what they wanted from the conversation. Hey, I just joined. What's up? Not a whole lot. A little bored. How's everyone? So even in the fake example bot conversation, the users were bored. <laughs> Anyway, if you go to the IR website now, as of uh, just the middle of June, uh, very recently, they have this photo of crying Squidward saying, we love doing more together on IRL.com. <laughs> But it turns out the app was completely fraudulent, has been shut down, and is in the middle of ongoing legal investigation, which may require this hero CEO, this millennial icon, to have to give back the money and face jail time <laughs> to Masayoshi-san, who 
needs it. Let me tell you, they could use the win of getting the money back. So I, I wondered, you know, this got to be a tough time for them over there at IRL, all the employees that got laid off and him and his siblings. And, you know, I'm sure they really believed in their, in their app. And so I thought I would give him some advice that I found from this great CEO article. <laughs> It's called five things you need to be a highly effective leader during turbulent times from 2020. <laughs> so I wondered, I wondered what this guy had to say. What was his advice? And what I found was when they asked him, did you ever consider giving up? Where'd you get the motivation to continue your challenges? He said, I discovered my why. My business gives me value beyond money and feeds my soul. <laughs> So I just really think on that when you planned from the beginning to <laughs> create 95% fake users. And then he also said, when asked, what is the best way to communicate difficult news to one team, one's team and customers? He said, real life is messy and the truth will come out. <laughs> Be vulnerable, open, and honest. Interesting. Incredible vision for the future. Speaking of apps that have been shaky lately, let's jump over to an app everyone here knows that did a lot better than IRL and give a win to Zoom. <laughs> Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. It, in the it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but I'm here live. It's not, I'm not a cat. This might give some of you flashbacks to Zoom school, but let's focus up because Zoom is in the news lately for a specific reason. But I wanna give a little bit of background. You guys all know Zoom was the darling of the pandemic. In 2020, Zoom, which had been running for years before that, suddenly experienced a massive surge in stock growth. As you can see here, as every airline in America had their stock collapse, <laughs> Zoom rocketed up 129%. Massive growth in 2020. In fact, Zoom stock was in such hot demand from every investor in the 2020 2021 era that even a stock that just sounded similar had an 1800% spike. <laughs> this was Zoom Technologies, the wrong company. People bought the wrong company on accident and even that one had a spike. That's how much demand there was. And this guy, the CEO, Eric uh, Yuan, was considered a genius, okay? Eric Yuan connected the world and they asked him about what he thought about the future of work. And he had a blunt message. He said, working from home is here to stay. <laughs> Well, if you guys don't know, Zoom stock has gone back to exactly where it was before the pandemic. <laughs> it has completely lost every dollar it gained in those two years. And as of today, they're making their staff return to office. <laughs> and if Zoom's doing it, that's a bad sign. But is it the end for the work from home revolution? The answer might shock you as I looked into it more. There is a huge reason why companies and uh, local governments, basically cities, want people to return to office. And it's not for the benefit of you <laughs> or for the benefit of productivity. One of the main reasons is that real estate values, which is what a lot of very wealthy, either banks or rich people's uh, investments are tied up to, commercial real estate, basically office buildings, is collapsing. And if they don't get in use again soon, it's gonna be a real problem for their wealth. Additionally, cities like New York, for example, rely on the tax revenue that a bustling downtown gives them. And they need to stimulate the city's economy by making sure everybody is forced back to work. And so you can see that New York City Mayor Eric Adams is meeting with 100 CEOs to try and get workers back to the office. And if you look, trouble is still continuing to mount because people are reluctant. People are trying their damnedest, now that they've tasted the freedom of no commute, to not go back into the office. Again, uh, the office real estate sector is experiencing some real trouble. There could be a serious serious collapse in office real estate values very soon. Because if you look up as of literally the end of last month, this is occupancy of downtown metros. You'll notice it's up from the pandemic lows, but stabilizing basically around 50%. That means half of all office buildings are vacant. You can see it basically right here. It's actually 49.2% average city occupancy, which means like even with all of this demand and all this to pull me back to the office, they're still empty which means it's almost unavoidable that we're gonna see a real estate collapse in commercial real estate. And if you want to take it from someone other than me, as I play balloons on stream and yell it and mauled, <laughs> maybe you listen to Steve Eisman, who is the guy from The Big Short, played by Steve Carell. I mean, do I think commercial real estate, well, not commercial real estate, office real estate uh -huh. is going to be a problem. Yeah, we do. But that is going to put some real pressure on, on wealthy people's like investment portfolios, specifically in real estate and banks. We have not seen the last bank failure since SVB, given how many of them are levered up on commercial real estate. We'll see where that goes. Now, 
Google has a plan to solve this. Google is offering, and this is a huge win, they're offering a $99 hotel option on campus that the employee has to pay for. <laughs> These are not reimbursed and the employee has to buy them on their own personal credit card to stay in a dorm room on campus. And the way they sold this to their employees was by saying, just imagine no commute to the office in the morning. And instead you could have an extra hour of sleep and less friction, which is exactly what work from home already offered. <laughs> but now you have to pay $99 a night for it. It's fucking amazing. Uh, so that's a big win, but unfortunately, unfortunately, I have to give a fail now. There's gonna be one group of people that is seriously gonna lose out over the next 18 to 24 months. I almost, I'm afraid to say it because they're such a pivotal part of our society, but it's people who love endless amounts of Marvel slop. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to give them a fail because some terrible news has happened. And that is that the VFX workers at Marvel have voted to unionize. No! They're not gonna crunch for my slop? No! I wanna watch more slop, dude. <laughs> Overworked and underpaid, the VFX workers vote to unionize at Marvel. In a response to rising the hot labor summer in Hollywood, finally, the VFX workers, which have had zero union at all, they're not voting the strike, by the way, they're just voting to unionize, but it's a, it's a first step. A super majority of Marvel's more than 50 worker crew had all signed authorization cards indicating they wish to be represented by Yahtzee and, and join the, the, uh, the labor movement. So the VFX industry has been non-union since the 70s, and they even made this cool poster of Iron Man's fist and Black Panther's fist and Thor's fist. Oh, <laughs> fucking. But yeah, they're, 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 they're unionizing. And again, one of the reasons they're voting to do this is because they have been, let me give you an example. Production designers, art directors, camera operators, sound operators, editors, hair and makeup artists, costume and wardrobe people, script supervisors, grips, lighting, props, paint. Every one of those groups on a Hollywood set has a union that protects their rights and makes sure they don't get crazy overworked. VFX is the only one that doesn't, and now they'll be joining. VFX coordinator Bella Huffman stated, turnaround times do not currently apply to us. Protected hours don't apply to us. Pay equity doesn't apply to us. Visual effects is not sustainable and not safe. And people have suffered far too long and all newcomers to the industry need to know they won't be exploited. I'm all for it, except for the fact that I won't get my daily slop. If you can't get your Marvel Cinematic Universe slop, we've already talked about how Barbie has broken a billion, bar billion and counting, this is the Warner Brothers lot, is like the best performing Warner Brothers movie of all time, and they're gonna wanna make a lot of slop based on the success of this film. They wanna follow this up with 45 more Mattel Cinematic Universe toy movies. 45 more to come, featuring Tom Hanks, Vin Diesel, J.J. Abrams, Lena Dunham, and I was about one in particular. You remember in the previous Marketing Monday, I talked about how they had this idea to do a action heist movie with Lil Yachty based on the card game Uno. And we made fun of it, but it is kind of weird and different, you know? It's kind of interesting. Uno tweeted this, it sounded cool. I mean, listen, maybe it's trash, but at least it was different. Well, unfortunately, they're gonna be going in a different direction. And I wanna talk about this because it's actually kind of frustrating they don't understand why this movie might have been successful. You see, what was leaked in this New Yorker piece was that the original script was, quote, fuck heavy. <laughs> It had Lil Yachty, it had a fuck heavy script, and it was about Uno. It was also set within the Atlanta hip hop scene. So it was like this dope Atlanta hip hop heist movie featuring Lil Yachty that's like rated R. And I'm like, this sounds kind of sick. <laughs> I'm actually kind of interested. And unfortunately, a Mattel executive flagged it and they got worried about it. They cut it down to one PG-13 well-placed fuck and now have abandoned the idea altogether. And they're gonna go in an entirely different direction for the Uno movie, which sounds to me a little disappointing because I looked back at how Barbie, whatever your opinion on Barbie, I think one of the coolest things about it to me was that it was absolutely, especially the second half, not what I was expecting from a Mattel movie. I thought it'd be way safer. And the reason for that is because when they asked Greta Gerwig to make it, her and Noah Baumbach co-wrote a script and turned it in and said, basically, you can't have any notes on it. <laughs> and when Mattel said, hey, let's change this, 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 and this, their agent said, are you fucking crazy? You should have come into this office and thanked me when Greta and Noah showed up to write a fucking Barbie movie. <laughs> 
That's a good agent right there. And basically got them to back down. And that was back when Mattel, you know, they didn't, they didn't know anything about Hollywood. There was their first movie. And so they just agreed basically carte blanche to fund $100 million into Greta Gerwig and Noah's self-written script Barbie movie. And they created the movie they wanted to make. And I feel like they're not learning that lesson at all by canceling this cool little yachty Atlanta fucking hip hop idea. All right, do you understand? The executives of Mattel have no idea how to make a movie people don't watch. Give the money to an artist and just hope they make your fucking uh, product look good. So big fail to them for that. I want to give a win though, because they do have one good marketing idea around Uno, which was basically <laughs> they're going to pay you $277 an hour to play it. <laughs> It's an interesting marketing concept. You see, they said basically they know that advertising Uno won't do shit. So they created a job to basically play Uno on TikTok. That's it. <laughs> and they'll pay you $277 an hour. Anyone here that needs money, look into it. I think if they're smart, just offering the job already got them more coverage than buying any ad space would have. <laughs> it's a clever way to adapt to the new marketing environment that's basically all around social media. And if that's not going to make you money, again, on Marketing Monday, I'm always trying to find ways for you guys to make money. I know you guys want me to find you ways to make money. If you don't want this job, I understand Uno's too tough. I've got you a better one that this guy discovered. Basically, he goes to Home Depot. He goes to the doors section where you can just buy full doors. He picks it up. He goes to the return section and says, hey, I'd like to return this door. <laughs> I lost the receipt. They pay him the money <laughs> and he takes the fucking money and leaves. Now, even better, if they don't pay him the money, he walks out with the door for free. <laughs> and he did that hundreds of times to make $300,000. So he ended up just moving through all these doors from Home Depot to itself. 370 times he did it to make $300,000. Now, obviously, I give this guy props for finding the loophole, dude. All right, if you're a hustler, you figured it out. But I do have to think on a grand scheme level, I'm a little frustrated because people like this ruin it for everybody else who just wants to return something without the receipt one time. <laughs> now, every legitimate person who lost their door receipt and wants to return it is fucked forever because this asshole wanted to make 300K for free. So I give him credit, but I'm also a little pissed off at you, okay? And speaking of dubs and speaking in no way of China, let's talk about China. What's that, Beijing? What is going on in the world of China? What's my man Xi Jinping? It turns out one of his old favorite hobbies, cracking down on Hong Kong. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you got to go back to the oldies with the goodies, dude. If you really enjoy doing something. Uh, if you guys don't know, in 2020, 2021, there was obviously all the massive protests in Hong Kong as China began a crackdown. Now, in 19, up until 1997, Hong Kong was basically like a British colony or outpost, and they gave it back to China. But Hong Kong obviously had different rules, laws, structures, and government. They created like a, a temporary peace where basically Hong Kong would have different rules than the rest of China. They wouldn't be under the Great Firewall. They'd be able to have, that, have access to open internet. They would have, you know, different elected leaders. And China had promised that these these rules and regulations that were different would last until 2047. They didn't. <laughs> they lasted until about 2020. Then there was a huge crackdown, big protest that lost, and China took control. But now, things are still different in, in, in Hong Kong. Again, you can see they still don't have the Great Firewall on. Their controls on speech, news media, and culture are less sweeping. Hong Kong still has a little bit more freedoms, but people are leaving in droves. This article says the biggest wave of immigration in decades and the labor force has shrunk by 5%. People are just leaving Hong Kong if they can. And this one was an interesting stat that showed Hong Kong migration to Canada, which had a massive spike after the protests in 2020. Once they realized the protests weren't going to work, people left for Canada and other countries, assumedly. So that was the situation until now. But unfortunately, these still lax rules are not enough for the party and Xi Jinping, and they are cracking down even more. For example, five speech therapists were jailed for sedition because they published a children's book that portrayed Hong Kongers as sheep fending off wolves, representing China. <laughs> they have said libraries should ensure they do not spread any kind of messages that are not in the interest of Hong Kong. So anyway, the crackdown is getting more serious and people are responding. There was a guy, again, a, a filmmaker who had previously, before the protests, made a video about the protest, like right at the beginning of the protest, he made a protest. And then he's obviously said, okay, I backed off and made a normal rom-com movie 
and they still banned him. Theaters wouldn't be allowed to play his film just because of his previous work. So again, the crackdown is getting more serious. They're using the example I heard was they called it a blurred red line where they don't say specifically what the rules are. They just imply that there's going to be stricter censorship. <laughs> they sort of leave it up to you to figure it out, which means they never have to like follow the exact rule. It's, it's, a, it's a bad look. But what's a good look is that they're making films of their own including a brand new TV documentary showcasing the army's ability to attack Taiwan, which was released this week. Uh, I think it's a nine part TV documentary that shows specific members of the Chinese PLA armed forces uh, in the army and the, and the Navy and the air force talking about how they'll be willing to give their life <laughs> to fight and die to take Taiwan, including military drills, examples like of how they would <laughs> attack Taiwan including one guy who said, if we can't get rid of the, the sea mines, the naval mines in the strait between China and Taiwan, I will use my body to detonate them myself. <laughs> Again, tensions over Taiwan continue to heat up. Uh, United States recently announced a $345 million military aid package for Taiwan. So again, uh, neither side is really backing down here. And I know that everybody says nothing will ever happen, but it just feels to me, again, continually, more and more that rhetoric and money and drills continue to ramp up. The US keeps putting more money in Taiwan. Taiwan builds more defenses. China keeps doing more drills and building up their military presence. China and Russia just did a, a military like drive-by or test off the coast of Alaska. I don't know. I'm just saying. Now, of course, all of this talk about war is not the most important thing coming out of China. I shouldn't even, I should barely have mentioned it. The most important thing in China is that this poor kid is not being allowed to use his smartphone because new rules have come out in China that is restricting children's access to smartphones. They're adding a minor mode that limits screen time and content for young people. And I want to talk to Xi Jinping directly for the rest of this Marketing Monday. Sir, this kid could be a hero of your country. If you're gonna restrict him to 40 minutes of smartphone time, I'm worried about his ability to take part in the great internet brain glow up that all of us American children have, <laughs> have experienced. Now, I do appreciate that you made it 40 minutes so they have enough time to watch the entire 55 episodes of Skibbity Toilet. However, you ruined that by including content locks. That means the videos can only be about life skills, general knowledge, age appropriate news, and entertainment content or positive guidance. Does Skibbity Toilet fall into that or not? G, you're making a huge mistake. If these kids can't get this entertainment, they're not gonna be what they need to be for the future which is what they want to be, <laughs> vloggers, YouTubers, and professional streamers. That is the number one demanded job in America, okay? Our kids are training. We're getting stronger and more powerful at these high demand jobs. Esports star, professional gamer, influencer. And if you are gonna ruin this one, you better not ruin these two, except he did. Not only can they not use their smartphone, if you're under 16, you're banned from live streaming. The next Tommy in it will never come from China. At least you have esports, right? No, they banned uh, gaming. You can only game for three hours a week. Now I looked into this. I know how good Chinese esports is. I was, there's no way this ban is actually in effect. I mean, it would threaten their esports dominance, warns Chinese players. This can't actually be in effect. Well, it turns out based on the only set I could find, it is effective, <laughs> but not at making them do anything healthy. <laughs> It turns out that when kids are banned from gaming more than three hours a week, they don't study more, they don't go outside more. All they do more is more social media, more texting friends, and more watching Doyin videos, which is basically Chinese TikTok. <laughs> Maybe we're not so different. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is Marketing Monday. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week for another Wins and Fails. Check it, check it. Hey.